Alright everybody, welcome back to day two of the final review. I'm going to be speed running through one problem from each section so I can give you guys enough time to work on this as well. In number three here, from the first section, I'm going to go and try and prove these two triangles congruent if possible. Uh, what do I know about the triangles? Well, I know that angle P is congruent to angle S. How do I know that? Well, they gave it to me, right? They told me in the drawing, so I can actually just say given would be my reason. For the same reason, I can say that PT is congruent to ST. Again, it's given, right? They told me this information, so thank you for giving me something. Now, the last piece of information I'm going to have to kind of extrapolate. This angle here and this angle here, I have a sneaking suspicion that they are congruent. I can say that angle PTQ is congruent to angle STR. Now, why can I say that? Well, our good old buddy vertical angles comes back and allows me to say it. So, based on that, I can then say that triangle PTQ is congruent to triangle STR. And the reason why I have that is because I've got an angle, a side, and an angle. That sounds like ASA to me. And that wraps it up for number three. Let's move on to number 12. This is now in the next section. Proving triangle similarity. Well, what do I know about these triangles? I can say that angle S is congruent to angle E. And I can also say that angle B is congruent to this nondescript angle here. So why don't I call him angle, let's give him a name. I'll call him angle A. So I can put that down there. So based on that, at minimum, you know, they might be congruent, they might not be, but at minimum, they're similar. So I can say that triangle uh, BTS is congruent to triangle, let's see, that would go um, A, N, E. And that's because of our good old buddy angle angle similarity. Okay? Number 15 rests on the laurels of R and T being parallel. Now it says it in the in the instructions above, so make sure you guys are aware, because I'm going to make an assumption right now, and if you don't know that R and T are parallel, you're going to think I'm wrong. But R and T are established as parallel, so why don't I go ahead and just establish that? That way I can make this assumption. Well, this 5x is this larger angle here. Now, by extension, I can say that this angle on the bottom right is also 5x by vertical angles. Now, this 3x minus 40 here is this angle right here. So, it looks like the 5x and the 3x minus 40 are on the same side of the inside of parallel lines. Well, there's a term for that. Same side interior angles. 5x and 3x minus 40 are, in are same side interior angles. And there's a relationship that happens. If I sum those guys together, I get 180 degrees because same side interior angles are supplementary. So from here, I can go and just keep on going. 8x minus 40 is equal to 180. If I add 40 to both sides, I get 8x is equal to 220. If I divide by 8, that's kind of a large number, so I'll go ahead and just do a little bit of math here. So 8 goes into 220. 8 goes into 22. Looks like twice with a remainder of 6. I don't think that's going to divide out evenly, so why don't I go ahead and just divide both by 2. So it looks like if I divide both by 2, I get 110 over 4, which if I, if I divide by 2 again, I will get, looks like 55 over 2. Cool. Here we go. We are on number 15 of the review packet. And so... First of all, this problem here rests on the laurels of knowing that R and T are parallel lines. So it says it in the instructions, so I'm going to make an assumption, and uh, if you don't know that they're parallel, then you're going to start thinking I'm wrong, but the lines are actually parallel. So I'm going to go and just establish their parallelness by drawing the little Star Trek symbol in there. Okay, so what, what do I know? 
I know that this angle up here, this small, this larger angle here is 5x. By vertical angles, I can call this 5x, which means the 5x and the 3x minus 40 will have a relationship. They are the same side angles on the inside of parallel lines. That makes them same side interior, which means if I add them up, I should get a supplementary relationship. In other words, they should add to 180 degrees. 5x plus 3x is 8x, minus 40 equals 180. If you add 40 to both sides, you would get 8x is equal to 220. If you divide by 8, I don't think that's going to go in evenly. But if I divide both top and bottom by 2, I would get 110 over 4. I feel like I can do that one more time in order to get 55 over 2. Again, I just divided by 2 twice to reduce my fraction, and that was the end of that problem. Okay, it is a speed run, and there are certain problems that I think are easy enough to where you guys can handle them, but we will have plenty of time for questions if not. I'm going to skip a few sections here and go to problem 42. Similar triangles, how do I know? It's because these two lines are parallel, which means these corresponding angles will be congruent, and this angle P will be congruent to itself when I go to split apart those triangles. So how do I do that? Well, if I do this, that means I have P, E, and L right here. And then the large triangle will be P, N, and A. Right? So is everyone, hopefully everyone is comfortable with the idea of angle P being congruent to itself. So what does this allow me to do? Well, I'll put in my dimensions. The X goes here. The 9 goes here. Okay? Now, where people are going to make a mistake is they're going to think this length PN is 6 because they see this 6 here. It's not. It's X plus 6. Same way down here. PA is not 8. It's not. It's actually 17. So, what do I do? I can now compare sides. I can say X is to X plus 6, corresponding side to corresponding side, as 9 is to 17 and now I'm ready to cross multiply. 17x equals 9, careful, it's not times x, but it's rather times the whole thing. So I can distribute that in, scroll down a little bit, 17x equals 9x plus 54. Subtract 9x from both sides, I would then get 8x equals 54, divide by, whoops, not 4, divide by 8, and I don't think that goes in evenly. I think at best I can divide them both by 2 to get 27 over 4, and I think that's as far as we can go with that problem there. Here we go. We are on rapid fire, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and just solve these. Um, pretty straightforward. If I just FOIL this thing out, I'll get x times 2x, which is going to be 2x squared. If I multiply those guys together, I will get 3x. Multiplying these guys together would get me negative 10x. And then multiplying the last pieces together would then get me negative 15. Combine the like terms, 2x squared minus 7x minus 15. And that makes short work of 46. You could have used an area model if you wanted to. It's up to you. It just depends on what you feel like doing. 54, we're doing 46 in reverse with 54. Before I do anything, I have to make sure I can reduce this thing as best I can. I'm going to factor it if it's possible. But look at the terms they have in common. A 3, a 3, a 36. I think our good old buddy GCF is going to make his triumphant return. And then that will become a minus 12. And then from here, your factors are going to be x plus 4 and x minus 3. But don't forget the 3 that you factored out. This is not an equation. It's an expression, which means the 3 ain't going anywhere. Okay, You are not going to divide 3 on both sides, because there is no both sides. There's only one side. So don't, please don't make that mistake. Unlike 66, which is an equation, we can divide if we wanted to. I would not recommend it because this number is odd. This thing looks like it's queued up pretty well for the quadratic formula because it's you know a two and odd. But 
at all times, I really would like you to try to factor this thing if it's possible. Because if it's not, what do you have to lose? A few seconds, and then you bust the quadratic formula on it. Anyway, let's try this thing out. 2x, x. I think I can come up with two numbers that would add up to 7 with this setup here. I think if I put a 4 right here, that would get me an 8x. If I put a 1 right here, that would get me a 1x. And I think those guys can combine out to become a positive 7, as long as the 8 was positive and the 1 was negative. So what does that tell me? It tells me that 2x minus 1 is equal to 0. It tells me that x plus 4 is also equal to 0. So x would equal 1 half, and x would equal negative 4. And on to more solving. So problem 69 says to solve using completing the square. Why is this queued up for completing the square? Because a is equal to 1, the b term is even. So what I'm going to do, and it's not factorable, so let's go and just take care of it. x squared minus 6x. I'm going to leave myself space because I'm going to add 12 to both sides. In completing the square, I'm going to add the boxes on either side. The number that goes inside the boxes is going to be negative 3. This allows me to factor this quickly. I can pull 1x from the left and 1 negative 3 from the right. Again, 1x, 1 negative 3, and I square the whole thing. And that's going to equal 12 plus negative 3 squared, which is going to be 9. 12 plus 9 is 21. Square root both sides x minus 3 equals plus or minus, don't forget the plus or minus, rad 21. If you add 3 to both sides, you will get x equals 3 plus or minus rad 21. Again, if you wanted to split it up, you could call it 3 plus rad 21 or 3 minus rad 21. These are technically both of your answers. And now problem 77, they're asking us to use the quadratic formula, so why not indulge them? I would use the quadratic formula anyway because the coefficient in front of the x squared is not 1. a is 2, b is 2, c is 3. So the quadratic formula is x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So how do I set this up? x is equal to negative thing plus or minus the square root of a thing squared minus 4 times 2 things all over 2 times a thing. What goes inside said things? A 2, a 2, a 2, and a 3, followed by another 2. A lot of 2's floating around. I hope you guys are aware of which 2's are where. This 2 is really a b, and so is this one. This 2 is really an a. 3 is obvious, it's C, and this 2 is the A. So just associate back and forth quadratic formula with plugged in thing. So x equals negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 4 minus 8 times 3 is, uh, sorry, 8 times 3 is 24 all over 4. That gives me negative 2 plus or minus rad negative 20 over 4. Now, in the past, we were able to say, thank goodness, square root of a negative, no solution, but not anymore. We are electromagnetic, mechanical, technical service diagnostic engineers from Chuck E. Cheese. We can handle square roots of negative numbers because square roots of negative numbers produce imaginary numbers. So how does this break apart? Negative 20 underneath the square root. You don't have to do this if you don't want to, but this is what I'm thinking. The square root of negative 4, the square root of 5, this is 2i and a rad 5. So that's what this guy becomes. I really have negative 2 plus or minus 2i rad 5 all over 4. Now, I want you guys to pay attention to something. This is even. So is this and so is this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this fraction apart and call it negative 2 over 4 plus or minus 2i uh, rad 5 over 4. I can reduce them individually and call them negative 1 half plus or minus i rad 5 over 2.
and there is the next section. A little bit of a different orientation for these problems here because one's a word problem and takes up a lot of space. Uh, but basically here, again, we're going over some right triangle trig stuff. I see an angle. I see two sides. i got to solve for x. I start thinking about a relationship. I've got an angle, an opposite side, and an adjacent side. That makes me think about tangent. And I know tangent of that angle is going to be opposite over adjacent. Got to solve for x. How do I do that? I'm going to multiply both sides by x. I get x tan 11 is equal to 12. Again, get x by itself. Just divide by tan 11 because tan 11 is a number. It's just a number you haven't put into your calculator yet. So ultimately, you get x equals 12 over tan of 11, which ends up being 61 point something. Uh, you can go ahead and use your calculator for that. And it's on to the last problem here, probability. Parker must choose the right attire for the dance. He has seven shirts that would work for the dance, three blue, one white, two black, and one red. He can wear either khaki pants, blue pants, or black pants. If he chooses his attire at random, what is the probability he will wear a blue shirt and khaki pants? Well, probability says the probability of him choosing a blue shirt, well, there's a total of seven shirts. He has three blue ones, which means his probability of choosing a blue is three out of the seven shirts. This is a pretty basic probability problem. There's no real need for a tree or area model. Uh, the probability of the khakis, well, it says he only has three pants, right? Khaki, blue, or black. So it's not like he has multiple iterations of each one. So he, if he's only going to pick the khaki pants, it's one out of the three. So the probability of him wearing both at the same time is like saying the probability of blue and khaki. Now, I emphasize the and because the and should tell you to multiply the two probabilities together. So what does that look like? It looks like 3 over 7 for the blue, 1 over 3 for the khaki. If I'm going to multiply two fractions together, the threes are going to cross divide out, giving you a 1 seventh probability that Parker will go to the dance wearing a blue shirt and khaki pants like a good SeaWorld employee. I will see you guys tomorrow.